In the early 90s, the internet was still largely thought of as a space for information, one that had grown out of academia and research. But in 1993, the activist Jeffrey Chester was warning that it could become a privately owned public space, a virtual electronic shopping mall, as corporate interests were circling. The old NSFnet infrastructure had been decommissioned, and throughout the 90s, internet through telephone lines, then through cable, was becoming dominated by the telecommunications giants. AT&T, Sprint, and Verizon. Western Union had dominated telegraph communications in the late 19th century, buying up over 500 competitors to have the control over a near monopoly. It started to abuse its position, using it to keep competitors out of the market and to prioritise its own associates over others. As the antitrust movement grew, those fighting the monopolies weren't just concerned about anti-competitive practices, but what it meant to have single men like the robber baron Jay Gould in control of almost the totality of infrastructure that was essential to the security of the country. In response, Congress passed a non-discrimination law. No single company should have a say on the entire network and telecommunications and railways must abide by what was called common carriage. They had to treat anyone wanting to access the network equally. Fast forward to the 1990s, and the same rules were applied to the telecommunications giants. Networks had to grant access and couldn't treat their own partners or affiliates with favoritism. One judge said that assuring that the public has access to a multiplicity of Information sources is a governmental purpose of the highest order, for it promotes values central to the First Amendment. But throughout the 80s and 90s, this changed. As the Soviet Union collapsed, market liberalism triumphed, neoliberalism was at its peak, and government interference of any kind was challenged. In 2002, George Bush repealed the must-carry rules, and cable giants began refusing access to smaller internet providers across the country, who quickly went out of business. And across the US, telecommunications companies lobbied local government to prevent new networks from springing up. Municipal broadband is banned in 18 states, and big telecoms sign agreements with local authorities that often prohibit using other internet service providers. Net neutrality, the idea that data sent across networks should be treated equally, was being challenged too, and corporations began paying to have preferential treatment to send their own data faster than competitors. Big tech giants like Facebook, Google and Microsoft do deals with telecoms giants to send their own traffic at quicker speeds, essentially faster this shift towards digital laissez-faire coincided with another shift. After 9-11, security became more important than privacy. The Bush administration passed the Patriot Act, radically expanding the powers of the state to monitor its citizens and to gather data around the world. Using 9-11 as a justification, the surveillance state grew at the same time as starting to expand its own surveillance practices. Peter Swan, an expert in privacy in the Obama administration, said that with the attacks of September 11, 2001, everything changed. The new focus was overwhelmingly on security rather than privacy. NSA chief John Poindexter proposed a program called Total Information Awareness, TIA that could pick out signals that would predict and help stop future terrorist attacks. With this change, politicians seem to lose interest in regulating the big tech companies. Google and the NSA, for example, announced a partnership for Google to provide a search appliance capable of searching 15 million documents in 24 languages. The director of the NSA wrote that an effective partnership with the
private sector must be formed so information can be quickly back and forth from public to private, classified to unclassified, to protect the nation's critical infrastructure. New techno-industrial military complex was born. Google spent more time in Washington, spending more money on blogging. The Washington Post called Google the master of Washington influence. While the New York Times ran a story saying that Google is very aggressive in throwing its money around Washington and Brussels and then pulling strings, people are so afraid of Google now. The techno-industrial military complex provided the context for corporations to spend vast sums of money expanding their operations and influencing both politicians and the public through PR that claimed that what they were doing was good for the community. As the social fabric was being shredded, as Margaret Thatcher made her famous claim that there was no such thing as society, increasing numbers became isolated and atomized. Memberships to churches, to unions, and even famously bowling clubs declined, and big tech claims that in their space they were rebuilding that sacred lost notion. Absolutely instrumental in changing the law. 
we've got about 250 of our hosts to show up at blind use hearings and to give up a day of work. Meanwhile, in 2018, Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin, Bordeaux, Brussels, Krakow, Munich, Paris, Valencia, and Vienna all wrote a joint letter to the EU asking them to intervene in what they saw was a growing problem. Airbnb had been involved in 11 lawsuits against the authorities to try and avoid regulation, while many cities had been back with their own regulation, including caps on the number of days a property can be left. Muldoon calls this community watch. He writes, According to the spin of tech savings, making billions of dollars is almost incidental to or a welcome and unexpected byproduct of their social life, connecting the world and giving people a sense of belonging. There is a deep irony in one of the world's most successful entrepreneurs portraying his company as a champion of grassroots community. At a 2017 Facebook Community Summit, Zuckerberg took to the stage by saying, It's not enough to simply connect the world. We must also work to bring the world closer together. Communities give us that sense that we are part of something bigger than ourselves, that we are not alone, that we have something better ahead to work for. Current mayor in Chicago with all of you, where there's so much great work that's going on building communities. All of you here today have built some of the strongest communities on Facebook. Now you build communities for new moms and dads, for helping kids get into college. One of the leaders here today, Derek Hooker, runs a community of locksmiths. Where are you, Derek? So, we are all here trying to do the most good we can for our families. And we know how lucky we are to be here and have this opportunity, and we know how much we owe it to our communities to give back. Now today, I actually want to share a milestone that we're really close to reaching for the overall With one hat, big tech companies support and lobby for deregulation that allows big capital to encroach upon community spaces, while on the other, they co-opt language and sentiment around the idea of community. It gives the impression that they're on the side of community. As George Orwell famously wrote, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable, and to give an appearance of solidity to pure win. Power twists commonly accepted values to make them sound appealing, or are continued Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Like Airbnb, Uber spends millions lobbying local governments to repeal regulation that has often been the result of long-fought battles by local taxi drivers. Certain regulations, like limiting the supply of taxis, were about risk reduction, so that during a downturn, drivers could still earn enough money. Uber systematically tries to circumvent and replace laws like this. Meanwhile, one study found that half of drivers in Washington, D.C. were living below the poverty line. Uber have fiercely resisted classifying riders as employees, assisting their self-employed so that they don't have to pay them sick leave or a minimum wage or paid vacation. The incursion into our political space, the theft of the community, a period of history that prioritised laissez-faire and surveillance security, reminds us that the shape and direction of any change is not natural. There's no such thing as empty cyberspace that can be moulded with new utopian rules from nowhere. The offline world, real power, real history, real politics, real economics, always intrudes. Utopia comes from the Greek, meaning no place. It's an apt description for the Californian ideology that saw cyberspace as no place, an infinite blank sheet upon which completely new rules could be written in some realm that's out there, disconnected, metaphysical. Thank you.
likely to click on. The shift towards surveillance in a political context that justified the diminishing of protection and the shrinking of privacy was like entering your home with sweets to tempt you while secretly looking at your likes and dislikes, who you live with, your pet's name and what you're cooking, all for the sake of personalization and subtly modifying behavior. And ironically, from their utopian no place, they become ubiquitous. How we travel, eat, watch, which apps we use, what we listen to. Two thirds of us get news through social media. Facebook and Amazon have acquired almost 100 companies each, and Google and Microsoft more than 200. The no place is everywhere. Zuboff calls it dispossession an incursion into undefended space. Your laptop, your phone, a web page, the street where you live, an email to your friend, your walk in the park, browsing online for a birthday gift, sharing photos of your kids, your interests and tastes, your digestion, your tears, your attention, your feelings, your face. 